that's where things really changed for him. And I didn't realize how that was directly a trauma for me, too. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Therapist Uncensored. This is a podcast that breaks down interpersonal science into practical and understandable tidbits. And as you listen, I can just imagine little light bulbs of insight appearing above your head. Absolutely. You're going to be surprised and touched at what you learn about yourself as you get more accurate and in-depth view of your mind and your heart and as you figure out those close to you. Therapist Uncensored brings you decades of experience with interpersonal psychotherapy, relational neuroscience, modern attachment, and anything else they think will be helpful in healing humans. Now, here are your co-hosts, Dr. Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. Hey, everybody. This is Season 3 and Episode 90. I'm Ann Kelly. And, you know, as therapists and as friends... We are often trying to encourage people to open up, but sometimes it can be really a hard thing to do. And today's guest is going to talk about why. Today, my co-host, Sue Marriott, is speaking with a best-selling author, Robert T. Mueller. He is a professor at York University in Toronto, and he's a fellow at the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Disassociation. You might have even seen his blog in Psychology Today, which was called Talking About Trauma. So his two books, Trauma and the Avoidant Client and Trauma and the Struggle to Open Up, are really core to the conversation today. So he's also a clinician and practices in Toronto, Canada. Before we get started, we have two new co-executive producers that have signed up with us with Patreon that we really appreciate. And it is Emma Wintersladen and Kathleen Geiger. Thank you so much. They are supporting as Platinum Neuro Nerds, and you can too. Just go to patreon.com backslash therapist uncensored. Okay, without further ado, I bring to you my co-host, Sue Marriott, talking with Dr. Mueller. Welcome to the show. Hi, Sue. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you having me on. It's, it's very exciting. For us too, I know that our audience is going to be really interested, particularly in the applied perspectives that you have as a practicing therapist, your clinical skills were just really clear in the book. Right before we got on, we were talking about our perspectives related to attachment from the difference between research and clinical work. I thought that might be a good place to pick up for you to begin to describe yourself and your perspective and where you're coming from. My work is all very attachment-oriented, relational psychotherapy. It's sometimes referred to as where I'm very interested in how the therapy relationship has a huge impact on how people do in therapy. With trauma survivors, it's critical because so much of what people have been through when they've been through trauma has to do with a damage to trust. And so often they feel a sense of betrayal or abandonment. And so because of that, the relationship is really critical in terms of how they recover from trauma. And the psychotherapy relationship is very important. It's, it's not just the psychotherapy relationship. Relationships in their lives are really important as well. So other close relationships can also be very healing when recovering from trauma, both with partners, with children, with friends. I take a very relational, attachment-oriented perspective in my work. That's where I'm coming from. I guess psychodynamic might be what you would say, but yeah. Part of what we were talking about before was sort of the difference between people know about the attachment categories versus kind of using it more on a spectrum and more for clinicians rather than researchers. That's right. And very often we speak in categories in mental health. And that's really kind of a, a problem. I think some of it helps because it's a simple way of talking. If you use DSM diagnoses or if you speak in attachment categories, it helps to transmit quick information. You know, this person has this sort of attachment style. But in reality, people are so much more complicated than the textbooks convey. The gray zones are very, very critical here. And people vary in attachment categories, sorry, in attachment styles, depending on their situations in life and depending on the kind of changes they have to their relationships. I don't like to pigeonhole people so much, you know. Absolutely. And you have a particular interest in the book. You are highlighting a particular avoidance versus other forms of psychopathology or other strategies to 
protect ourselves. So I'm just curious why you started there. What was your interest starting on that from that perspective? So my first book, Trauma and the Avoidant Client, I really worked on the issue of uh, avoidance and attachment. But in this book, I look at it much more broadly. I'm not just talking about, quote, avoidant attachment. I I use the idea of avoidance. I refer to it actually in the book as self-deception. What I mean by this is that there are certain strategies that we use that help us survive. And sometimes when people have been through trauma, the truth can be unspeakable. And when the truth is unspeakable, we edit the truth. And that's just a strategy that people use to survive. Avoidance is something that we see in families. We see this in institutions where whistleblowers who speak the truth about some ugliness in an institution often are seen as troublemakers. We see avoidance because of the phenomenon of family loyalty, where people stay the course in a particular family because The family reputation is so important and they're so afraid of upsetting the apple cart. They're coping strategies, really, ultimately. Yeah, I like to think of them as solutions to a problem, right? When we're avoiding something, we typically don't know that we're avoiding something. A hundred percent, yes. That's why I refer to it often as self-deception, that sometimes people avoid as a way of surviving. And the process is quite unconscious. It's not something people are doing. They're not, quote, lying. I mean, there's, there's a certain amount of self-deception that's necessary when you've been through horrific life experiences. There's so, one example in the book of a fellow who uses humor as a way of avoiding. And that's a nice example I like to use in my teaching because there's nothing wrong with using humor. In fact, humor is a fabulous way of managing. It's really a good way of being able to deal with life's difficulties. Gallows humor, you know, using some sort of dark joke that lets you cope with life's difficulties is an okay way to go through life. The problem is, is that it can be quite limiting. And for some people, when you know, everything's about, you know, joking around and lightening the mood, it's really hard for them to be able to deal with some of the vulnerability that's necessary for intimacy. And so we often see people with trauma histories who use strategies to manage, and humor is one of the strategies they use. So if you have somebody that you notice is unconsciously pleasant or avoiding and using, and one of the things I love about humor in particular, actually, is that it helps us co-regulate. So there is a way that it can cool off strain. But when you notice it being used offensively, can you speak a little bit about what your approach may be? The first thing is to notice it. I don't want to take away anybody's coping strategies. Coping strategies work because they they work. I mean, they're the strategies people have used to survive. So you don't want to take away somebody's coping strategies. But what you want to notice is whether the person themselves is feeling some ambivalence. So the fellow in the book, Nicholas, is the case that I use in chapter two, I believe, where he uses a lot of joking around. But where there are difficulties are in his relationship with his partner. He's never had a long-term relationship. His partner is the one who told him, you need to go for therapy, or I don't don't know what I'm going to do with you. And he was aware that, hey, I really struggle with closeness. And it's where he started to notice the price of some of his coping strategies, some of his solutions, as you say. That's where I was able to be like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So tell me about that. Tell me about where you've noticed that it's really hard for you to be intimate. And and you're referring to yourself as clowning around and how how you're not able to really sit with the pain that your girlfriend's telling you. Like in in the person themselves notice that's where you really want to sit with them around their own ambivalence about some of their own strategies, their coping strategies. We see this with alcohol use as well, problem drinking. Very often in trauma, people will use substance abuse, gambling addiction, sexual addictions. And again, people use these strategies because they work. And so you don't want to take a strategy away, but you do want to point out, hey, you know, how's this working for you, right? I mean, the, the old cliche, how is this working? And very often, well, it works a little bit, but it doesn't work that well. That's where you have a leg in into the story with people. I really love your approach because part of what you're doing is you're making it a bit more conscious and then you're still giving them the choice. But when we're doing it and we don't know that we're doing it, we don't even have that choice. And you're right. You don't take it away because that can just evoke more defensiveness. 
but rather I can hear this a very gentle inquiry that can begin to get the wheels spinning and help people be a little bit more conscious and aware, as you say. Yeah, that's for sure the approach I'm trying to take. Yeah. So can you say a little bit more about your therapeutic approach then specifically related to trauma? What kind of differential diagnoses do you do? And I don't mean diagnosis in the old DSM, you know, but it's almost like, can you give us access to your mind as you're sitting with someone about how that you're regulating your approach to help soften that unconscious front that people are putting up? One of the things that I think is really important, and I talk about this in the book, is the idea of post-traumatic growth, that people go through these trauma experiences very often, and they go through therapy, and we talk a lot about recovery from therapy. And I think recovery is important, but I had a client say to me, well, is, is that all I can expect? And I think that's true for some people, but people have different responses to life after trauma. And some people do reach a point of recovering their previous functioning, but other people actually, through therapy, come to a place where they grow from their experiences. And I wouldn't expect that everybody do that, but there are a good number of people who, having gone through therapy, especially when they have been through trauma, they have to do what David Brooks, the columnist, says is face the fundamental elemental questions of life. And I think that that is true, that people who go through trauma have to face fundamental questions about life. And, you know, why me? Why did I go through that? Why not me? Why was it my sibling and not me who went through that and I witnessed it? Am I ever going to be able to to feel better again? I mean, fundamental questions about their life, the world and their place in it. And I think when people really face that through therapy, very often they are able to grow from the experience. And again, it's painful, but it does lead many people to a place of change. And it can be quite something and surprising for many people. Well, and I like how you say that it's not, that's not a Pollyanna view at all. And I'm thinking about the research that talks about folks that are, you know, test out as secure naturally, (laughs) those Bigfoots out there, that actually people who have had to work on themselves and have had to earn security through reflection and contemplation and going through their experiences to make sense of it actually have higher reflective function than people who are naturally secure. And therefore, in relationships and everything, they're able to bring that high reflective functioning and that mindset into their relationships. They're still going to be more vulnerable to certain things. It doesn't erase the vulnerability, but in particular, you know, earned security can enhance connection and relationships more than natural security. That's really, really interesting. I think people who have this uh, sort of characteristic of earned secure, and it's a, it's a minority of trauma survivors. It's about a quarter. The research tends to show among trauma survivors, really, it's about one quarter who have that general style. I like to think of them as people who have balance, the ability to tell stories about their lives that have uh, some reflection in them, that have some ability to look at both sides of the coin, that don't get them so caught up in the pain of their story that they're doomed to either rebel against it or repeat it or be a victim to it, but rather they're able to look at their life history and say, okay, this was painful, this was a horrible chapter, I'm going to learn from this, I'm going to try to understand it. And so it's an okay place to be. A lot of people really struggle to get there, and therapy can help. You know, in our research, we found that in Women's College Hospital, in one of our studies, that a lot of people who had the avoidant attachment pattern or the preoccupied attachment pattern were able to move toward this earned secure attachment pattern with therapy, with trauma therapy. Right. You mentioned your research. Can you say a little bit more about that and things that you've learned through the research? A lot of things, but one of the things is that trauma is very tenacious. We did a whole bunch of studies over the years. I mean, I've been at this for about 25 years, different kinds of studies on trauma survivors who, who are in therapy, trauma survivors not in therapy, children, adults, families where there was trauma. 
And it's really remarkable how wide-ranging the effects of trauma are. They're negative, they affect people emotionally, they affect people in terms of relationships. Trauma histories uh, where there was abandonment and loss and betrayal, those tend to affect people in terms of academic functioning and work functioning. It's a powerful life experience that has a big impact on people. But having said that, the other very important thing that I've learned is how useful psychotherapy is. And yes, I'm a therapist. And yes, maybe I'm, I'm coming at it from that perspective. But we've looked at studies, we've done studies where there was random assignment of people to groups, we've done studies where we looked at naturalistic outcome in therapy, we've looked at children and adults, and we've looked at people who are adults reflecting on their therapy experiences and people who stick with therapy, if they have a therapist who listens who is patient, who is not trying to rush them along, and who's able to value the issue of trauma, like who's trauma-informed and doesn't want to talk about it and get over it, but actually sit with it and pay attention. If you have a therapist like that and you can trust that therapist, wow, therapy can be very healing. I've been shocked at times by clients who I would think, wow, I, I, I would not imagine that this person could get better. And they do. And again, it's not 100%. No therapy is. It's not 100%. But it can make a difference that can be enough of a difference that you really feel it as a change in your life. And that can be substantial and it's appreciable in people's lives. So that's another thing that we've learned that's been very optimistic for me. Yeah, it's tricky because the maltreatment in childhood or neglect, abandonment, kind of what I hear you saying is that it really does have profound impact, that there's a gravity to that. Yet at the same time, what we're discovering is that it's also fortunately due to neuroplasticity and things like that, that there's hope. And I hear your point about therapy and going ahead and getting professional help. We often encourage people, you know, whether it's therapy or not, but continuing to grow closeness by turning towards people, saying more, taking risks. But I agree when it comes to trauma in particular, that that's where that you really need to get somebody who knows what they're doing with all the f factors that you just mentioned. I really like that idea of taking a personal risk. I talked a little bit about that in the book, but that is absolutely true. So often my clients will, there's this idea of safety and safety is important and safety is fundamental. And if you don't have safety, you're not going to be able to improve in therapy, but safety is not quite enough. It's enough to help you be able to cope with things a bit better. And that's important. I don't want to diminish the importance of safety. I, I have a whole chapter associated with safety in the book, in chapter five. But at some point, helping people find a way to take a calculated risk, a thoughtful risk, and people will say, well, how do I know? Well, here's the thing. You don't know. That's why it's a risk. It's a risk. When people have suffered and have felt pain and they're in a terrible job and they're afraid to ask, you know, there's assertiveness issue problems because being assertive has led them to all kinds of trouble in their life. And I'm talking with them about maybe, you know, some assertiveness here and that's risky. And it's like, yeah, that's risky. How does that feel? How's that feeling in your body now when you even think about that? And, you know, what are you feeling? What are you feeling emotionally? And, and then we sit with those feelings and then we t do some breathing and then we imagine it and we imagine change together. And then it goes from that to at some point the client saying, you know, I, I'm sick of imagining. I think I really want, you know, I want some change. And I'm like, okay, well, hmm. and they're on the precipice of change. And I don't know how long they're going to be on that precipice, but at some point there's a plunge, there's a taking of a plunge and it's hard and I don't want to diminish it. It's scary. And sitting with someone and holding their hand while they take this risk, you're doing that with them and you're, and you're helping them make some wise choices, at least as best as you can as a therapist. But it, it is taking a calculated risk. Well, and you're really describing the therapist as sort of very actively supporting that, which, again, the way that I understand it, that really that experience in and of itself is already working on the trauma because your implicit experience of being with another literally changes. And I agree with you about safety can sometimes be overrated. I know some people would disagree with me about this, but I'd lead a lot of groups. And what we value is the capacity to engage in discomfort, you know. Safety can sometimes be a privilege, you know, depending 
depending on the color of your skin or where you live or where you are. So safety isn't the ultimate goal, but being able to let yourself be uncomfortable. Like I always, you know, if your heart's beating before you speak and you speak, we're in good shape. (laughs) And group, I think, kind of amplifies that because then you have the whole community, a small community that can provide that implicit change of experience. That's one of the things I love about group therapy you get that supportiveness, hopefully, if it's a supportive group. One of the issues that makes me think of is the issue of pacing in therapy. And I do talk in the book about safety first. I mean, it's, it's important. I talk about containment. A lot of therapists talk about safety, but one of the things that I, I really find important is this idea of containment. And what I mean there is where the client feels that you're kind of providing a, quote, holding environment, an environment where they feel they're being held to be able to then explore, and I really like the way you say that, sit with discomfort. That's part of exploration is sitting with discomfort. Whether it's taking a risk in a very concrete way in their outside life, or whether it's taking a risk by examining a painful aspect of their past that they hadn't really examined before. You know, why did I do that? I'm, the person wonders to themselves, was it my fault that such and such happened? Or, you know, what if I start thinking of this person who I thought of as a perpetrator and start thinking of them as having different kinds of characteristics, some good, some bad, and, and that sort of thing. Well, that's, ooh, that feels really uncomfortable. Maybe that's fair. Maybe that's uncomfortable unfair. I don't know. I'm not going to tell somebody what to think. But when they start to sit with discomfort and can tolerate it, then questions about trauma come to them that they hadn't asked before. And they're painful questions. You know, like very often things around blaming themselves are, is very often a, a thing that comes up a lot for people. And yeah, providing a containing environment allows them to do that exploration. And, you know, I actually just spoke earlier with Dan Brown, who is the co-author with David Elliott for uh, Attachment Disturbances in Adults, Comprehensive Treatment and Repair. And part of what the point that they make is that dealing with complex trauma is actually that trauma therapists who go how most of us are trained, which is into the content of the trauma. But if you have a disorganized system, you end up doing more harm versus just kind of their suggestion is to work on the attachment first, particularly if, again, if somebody comes at it from Dan's research was talking about that most people who have complex trauma, meaning the multiple systems involved, addictions and, you know, the psychopathology is just much higher and more complicated. You treat the attachment And that by treating the attachment and working on the relationships, that that's how you get to the trauma. And then sometimes that they don't even necessarily need to go that much into the trauma. What are your thoughts about that? So fundamental to my book, like fundamental is that the relationship, the psychotherapy relationship can be used as a laboratory, as a vehicle for change. And so what do I mean by that? What I mean is that sometimes things happen in the relationship that relate thematically to trauma. And a nice example I like to give is that if I'm the kind of therapist, you know, who enjoys the idea of being thought of as a smart person, a kind person, a caring person, which is there's nothing wrong with that. It's a very natural thing. And I'm working with a client who hasn't had a lot of kindness, hasn't had a lot of smart people sort of sitting and with them willing to give their attention. It's very easy for someone like that, if, especially if the client has low self-esteem, to fall into a pattern. And I say fall into, because I really mean fall into, it's unconscious, of treating the therapist like a kind of a guru. Now, if your countertransference is such that you have some needs, unmet needs yourself of recognition, then you can fall into a transference, countertransference, interlocking pattern where the two of you are replicating this guru-student relationship for years and years and years. And the client never takes risks, never changes, never steps out of that comfort zone. And the therapist doesn't push them. And that's a nice example of where you can fall into what's called an enactment in the relationship. These kinds of enactments happen all the time in trauma therapy. That's just one example, but there are 
countless examples of little things that you can fall into. The rescue fantasy is another enactment where the therapist wants to rescue the client and kind of treats them like they have to fix them and that sort of thing. There are many, many examples of this kind of thing, but enactments are really important to notice. If you're a good therapist and you're able to notice the enactments, then what you're able to do is use those enactments and sit with those moments and point out what's going on with the client and question what's going on between the two of you as a vehicle for looking at what happens in the person's outside life. And then you can start to make these connections. Isn't it interesting? How is the relationship with the therapist replicating what happens in the client's relationship with their partner? or with their children, the mom who has a trauma history who's so afraid of disciplining her child, you know, appropriately at all that their child, you know, runs amok, that kind of thing, because they're so afraid of any kind of uh, confrontation. And so you're sitting with the idea, perhaps in the therapy relationship, that maybe there's some conflict. And if you can work through that conflict with the person, boy, you can teach them something that they can then carry with them into their outside life. And it is phenomenal when that happens. And that's a relational kind of piece of work. And so that's what I really focus on in the book is being able to do that. If you can do that with people, then yes, you are helping the person relearn attachments. You're helping them relearn stable relational patterns. And that's exactly the kind of thing that you can do. And you can connect it to trauma stories rather than just simply hearing the story over and over again. I do ask people to tell me their story where it's relevant and where it's important to them and where it relates to themes in their life. I'm interested in their story, but no, I don't think exposure therapy is really where it's at. I don't see that as helpful for people unless the talking about it connects to some important theme. Like I said, low self-esteem or fear of aggressive feelings or needing to have somebody above you to be able to validate you or things like that. If those themes come up and they're trauma related, Mm -hmm. then it can be useful. When you're working at that level where that you can really examine what's going on between you and your client, or if you're the client, you and your therapist, and that's scary territory and exciting territory, but the therapist has to be able to get in there and be vulnerable with them and, and at times not know, or at times, like you're saying, these enactments or having very painful or strong feelings evoked in the therapist, that you have to be open enough to let those things happen so that you can work them through. Chapter eight, the first step in working through a rupture in the alliance or an enactment, as I mentioned before, is what I call looking inside. And I mean, the work is with the therapist. Number one, that's the first thing. And so like, you know, in that example of the guru enactment, the therapist has to ask themselves, first of all, notice that this is going on, and then say to themselves, what unmet need is going on in me? The kind of thing that might happen is you notice that week after week with your client, the client's coming in asking you questions, and you're kind of giving them mini lectures. And they may be smart lectures, and they may be very nice, and you may be saying things all of which are true. But is that really helping the person develop the kind of self-esteem and self-determination that's needed for them to be able to move forward in their lives? That's another thing. And, and, and you want to help them be able to do that, right? You want to empower people yes. also in therapy. <laughs> Yes, I don't know that that's the school of thought that's being taught in graduate schools, you know, that we we tend to enter this field with our own unmet needs, as you were saying, wanting to help people or wanting to be seen as helpful or wanting to, you know, fix our families and all of these things. So yeah, I really like how you're describing that that's, you know, the first thing. Let's take a quick break to thank our latest Gold Neuron supporters. We have Sarah Lazarus, Julie Kerbaugh, and Alice King, as well as BeTheAdult.org, which is a great blog you should check out. If you find value in the content of the show and what it gets out to the world, we're really asking if you could pitch in and help support the production. You know, so many podcasts are professionally produced and have big staffs putting together each episode. But here, what you see is what you get. We have our wonderful editor that helps us, Jack Anderson, but we do all of our own research, developing content, scheduling guests, etc. So we do a lot of work to maintain this awesome 
podcast as well as our online resources, our public and private Facebook page. So anyway, you get the idea. So this is why we need your help. So please go to patreon.com backslash therapist uncensored. You can become just a super nerd for $5 a month to show your support and get more content on a private feed. And some of our executive producers donate more to us and we love to list them on our Facebook page and our website. All right, back to the show. Another thing that you talk about, uh, if you could say a few words about the notion of forgiveness with trauma. I talk about rushed forgiveness. And in my chapter on forgiveness in chapter six, one of the things that I try to pay attention to is the idea that sometimes people feel a pressure to forgive. There's nothing wrong with forgiveness. Forgiveness is a noble goal and it's wonderful. When you can reach a place where you can forgive someone who has hurt you. That's a very good thing. But as a person myself who has grown up as a child of Holocaust survivors, I'm very mindful of the issue of apology and restitution and atonement. And I think one has to think about when when there's forgiveness, you have to ask yourself, well, has the person who has transgressed in some way recognized that they've done something wrong? Is there a sense of remorse? Is there a sense of taking responsibility? I see this a lot with couples that I work with, where there's one person who's saying, you know, my my partner had an affair. What's wrong with me? Why can't I forgive them? I'm just so always upset with them, you know, and I say to them, well, you know, what did your partner say? And it turns out very often, it's kind of a lame apology that the partner gave. And part of the work has to be, you know, is there a taking responsibility for what happened? Once there's a taking responsibility, then, you know, I think it's fair to ask yourself, can I find it in my heart to forgive? But what happens often with trauma survivors is rushed forgiveness, a sense of pressure to forgive. And part of the rushed forgiveness is trying to be able to get over the trauma quickly. And again, we cope with trauma in different ways. Getting over it, it's not really the way we recover from trauma. We have to deal with it. We have to feel the pain. We have to feel the loss. We have to wrestle with people who, you know, emotionally and verbally, we have to wrestle with the relationship with, with people who, who have harmed us in some way and, and figure out what we want to do about that relationship. And then if we do reach a place of forgiveness, great. I concern myself when people try to put pressure on themselves to forgive. That's where I, I feel concerned. You mentioned your own personal history and being in kind of a, this lineage of people affected by the more directly lineage of people affected by the Holocaust. What are your thoughts about how your own personal history impacts you now as a therapist? What are your reflections on that? I think it's had a big impact. I wasn't aware of this really until my 40s. I know it's weird because I was in, but this is it. We all do things that are out of our awareness. I had been through therapy and I had been aware of a lot of aspects of my family's relationship with me. My father, who, when I was in my 20s, was very critical, like very difficult man. I struggled in that relationship. We sat down, he and I, and had a lot of painful, very not so pleasant heart to hearts that then became pleasant increasingly as we started to work through some things. And my therapist was really supportive of that. So I was aware of that stuff and went into trauma therapy and all this. And then it was really in my 40s that I started to become aware of just how important my father's trauma was in my life. So my father's father was murdered and he was murdered in the Holocaust. My father was a little boy. And I came to realize, really, it's in the last 10, 15 years, that my father lost his childhood. And when he did lose his father, he had to go to work. He had to become sort of the man of the house. He didn't know how to be a kid at that point. He he had been. He had a pretty good childhood up to age 10. But he went through the Holocaust and his father was taken away. That's where things really changed for him. And I didn't realize how that was directly a trauma for me, too. It was profound, you know, having a father who didn't know how to be a dad, who didn't know how to be a kid, who didn't know how to play. Some of that came back when he became a grandparent, and I was able to see that it was really 
quite beautiful at times with my own children. I've, I have identical twin boys and mm -hmm. him coming over Friday evenings, he would come over just before we'd, uh, you know, get together as a family. He'd come over for a few hours even before I got home and he'd play with my boys and they would construct things together. And it was just really beautiful to see him challenge himself in that way. Stuff he couldn't do with me as a kid. I think that's where my life was affected by trauma. And it's sometimes hard for me to talk about, but it's important and it's a very real aspect of my life. Well, absolutely. And I was glad that you reminded me of that by mentioning it. And, and you talk about it a little bit in the book. So I felt it was okay. So I appreciate you sharing that. But it is such an important modeling, though, that we have to do that digging. And speaking of trauma, like, I was, you know, like, no wonder you're working with trauma. You know, so one of the things I was thinking was like, wow. And then the other thing I was thinking about, just the evocation, like what got evoked between you and your father, that was his history. You know what I mean? Like these, we're talking about it more from the stance of therapist to patient, but as parents that when we have trauma that's been not processed enough that we end up evoking and in, in, in these enactments with our children at times. And so it's one of these things where it's like a ball, like a, I think of a crystal ball with all these facets and we can keep spinning it around a little bit and things look a little different from each of these different perspectives. So I appreciate very much you sharing a little bit about that. And it's critically important. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. And I agree with you. I mean, it definitely impacted me and my parenting in a way that I wasn't fully aware. I think I was so focused on being a, quote, good dad or whatever, that sort of thing, trying to be playful with my kids and that sort of thing, that sometimes I lost the forest for the trees. Like I, I, I could really get caught up in little things that were minor and feel guilt like feel guilty for a long time and it was my wife who happens to be a child psychiatrist which is great it's a i recommend this for anybody uh, if you can if you can find a child psychiatrist to get married to it's very helpful <laughs> free therapy <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's very very helpful uh, and she's she's really smart anyway <laughs> <laughs> she would very often say to me, I'd just kind of catch, catch me doing it and kind of have me sort of sit with like the idea of this too shall pass. These, these kind of little things. It was hard for me to let go of those when, when my kids were younger. And I think I've gotten a bit better at it. I, I like to think I've gotten a bit better. I don't know, but maybe I have, maybe I haven't, but I know it was hard when my kids were young and I got sort of very, very focused on these mistakes as a parent, you know, kind of a lot of blaming myself. Oh, I could have done that better. I could have done this better. That sort of thing, I think. Well, absolutely. And, you know, I was raised by a father who also had trauma but going back to the topic of avoidance, like he was a police officer in the South and tough guy. And one of the things I became aware of later as a parent and how that affected me was that I would often find myself assuming what my kids were feeling based on what I felt. And so then I would be reacting to the wrong things, like if somebody was maybe a bit harsh or something, you know, that I, I would you know, the kids were fine. <laughs> so it's kind of losing track of that. So both of these, I think, are just, I wanted to sort of join you in the vulnerability of how some of these things that we have avoided, going back to this notion that not on purpose, it's they're outside of our awareness. So that it's this lifelong journey of continuing to integrate, to be able to, you know, again, change that implicit experience where that we can trust ourselves and be aware and be curious. And I like you bringing up play. It's a good way to kind of sort of round around to the uh, end of the interview of because we can't play if we don't feel safe. It's just impossible. Earlier, we talked about when it gets to a point in therapy where that, of course, I'm able to give them feedback. But when they realize that they're able to give me feedback too, <laughs> which I always say, but it takes quite a while sometimes for clients to actually take you up on that. But then the juice is so strong, we can do just about anything then if we're able to really talk about what's happening in the moment between us. I had a client the other day, she emailed me after a session and she said, print this email off and bring it into the session and ask me about what I'm feeling because if you don't, I'm going to lose my nerve. <laughs> 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 so, so I printed it off and I brought it in and I said, okay, sounds like you had a lot to say after the last session. And, and she, she was like, Whew. and she rolls up her sleeves and says, okay, you know, I was really, <laughs> I was really pissed off at you. Now, this is a person, this is not someone who talks about being angry at anybody. 
So this was huge. I was, I mean, first of all, yeah, I mean, she, there were some things she was upset with me about and, and it wasn't exactly pleasant to hear, but boy, I had to resist the temptation to stand up and, and shake her hand and say, thank you for finally being mad at me, you know, <laughs> like, but it was good. It was a helpful moment. And, you know, I mean, I did, I sort of sat with it and I was like, okay, what's going on here? And we sort of explored together and it was just such a nice moment. And in a sense, I felt very proud of her that she could like, rather than dwelling, and this is someone who could dwell on it for months, instead of dwelling on something like that, she took a risk and emailed me and said, I, I need you to raise it. So she asked for help there. And I did. And, and, and we went forward with it. And we were able to talk through something. I don't even remember what the issue was. It doesn't even really matter all that much. We were able to resolve some. Right. It doesn't even matter, right? Because <laughs> Yeah, we, we were able to resolve some kind of conflict that there was between us some sort of, uh, you know, and, and it was really helpful. That, you know, and I can hear, you know, like, it's just exciting and fun and pleasurable. There's such a life as we talk about that. And I bet you, I'm, I'm positive, actually, that that's true for the client, too, that she probably felt so great about that. And that we can be aware that there's something really magical happening, where that she had permission to bring her anger directly to you and give voice to it, and that it was safe, and that you would defend yourself as therapist or interpret her or do all the things that we can do hiding behind our therapist shields <laughs> that can leave people hanging. But I mean, that's the gold is that rich, relational, live, unpredictable engagement that can happen when people are able to turn and do that kind of relating in the session. It's just like a life force that happens or something. And it's a moment that you remember. I find them so memorable. For both of you. For both of us. Exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, sometimes I've clients, remember that time that I, you yeah. know. <laughs> right. So if you're listening and you're in therapy, then these are the, these are the ways to get into your therapist's mind and heart even more permanently. <laughs> as you start talking about how they're doing as a therapist, <laughs> they're going to pay attention and remember. <laughs> and that's part of how you know if you're in good hands, because when your therapist comes alive at that and is really open and receptive, that's a green light. Like that's really a really good sign for the therapy, don't you think? Because we can teach people all, you know, oh, tell that person what you think and how you feel. But when it's directed at us, all of a sudden, <laughs> things can change. Okay, so if some of the folks listening want to reach you, how is the best way for them to do that? Email is good. rmuller at yorku.ca. I'm a professor at York University in Toronto, Canada. But that's probably the best way to reach me. I mean, because then I'll, I'll be able to respond. Also, the other thing to note is that I have a blog on psychology today. And we will also be linking your books. I highly recommend it. For some reason, I don't, it took me a little bit to pick it up. But once I picked it up, it was like, it's really good. I think that you're a really excellent clinician. And that comes across really strongly in the book. So we would definitely recommend it. And we can put it on our resource page as well. So I want to thank you again. This is Dr. Robert T. Muller. And we encourage everybody to go to the show notes to, again, get these uh, links and resources. You can find that at therapistuncensored.com. And that way you can follow up and have more access and be able to hear more from him. Thank you so much. I really appreciated the opportunity to be able to speak with you and to be able to share some of the things that I think are helpful in therapy and some of the, the clients who have had an impact on me. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. All right. Glad you tuned in for the discussion with Sue Marriott and Dr. Mueller and hope you enjoyed it. Before you go, one more thing. Again, don't forget to sign up to support us and help us keep this production going before you forget, type into your browser, patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com backslash Therapist Uncensored. We've had more signed up. These are super nerds we want to thank you. That's Sarah Robertson, Danielle Zinger, Merlin Gottlinger, and Christine Musello. Thank you so much for your support. And finally, thanks for subscribing to our podcast. My gosh, we were so happy and appreciative of the ratings and reviews we get. We're just blown away. Please keep them coming. They really help us get the attention of excellent guests for the future. We have a podcast coming up very soon discussing both polyvagal theory as well as addiction. So stay tuned for more good content and we'll see you around the bend.
Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson. 